It is time now to turn to the theology of Karl Barth and his theology of the absolute beginning, what I'm going to call it, actualized. And I've turned the board over, and I'm simply going to leave this chart from Dr. Cassidy up for two reasons. A, I love it. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful chart summarizing the heart of Barth's theology. And secondly, it so easily expresses Barth's theology of creation. It's a wonderful uh, chart, uh, better than probably what I would have put up. Uh, and so I want to use it, uh, and I guess a third reason, it gives great continuity to our course, because we're back to a very, very familiar chart. As we begin to speak of Barth's doctrine of creation, I need to say something that frames his proposal in contrast to what we have just surveyed regarding how perichoresis, indoxation, incoronation, uh, Adam is the image of God and God's condescension to reveal the terms of the covenant, how that relates to Barth's own theology. And the best way I know how to put this up front is that for Karl Barth, the doctrine of God, his existence as the true God, the doctrine of man, man's existence as real man, are given in the same gracious and supernal time event. Bart calls that Jesus Christ. And so in, to, to, to speak quite basically, Bart's actualized doctrine of God requires his actualized doctrine of man. And this, which he also calls the Word of God, is going to stand over against everything that we've spoken of. I'm going to deal with this as we talk about Bart's doctrine of creation. But let me make a preliminary but foundational observation regarding Bart's theological ontology. Dr. Cassidy has covered this in various formats, whether it's his lecture material for this course, his lecture at the 2018 Reformed Forum Conference, his lecture at the 2021 uh, Reformed Forum Conference. Uh, he has done uh, uh, fantastic work on this, and I am grateful for it and appreciate it. Bart rejects the confessionally Reformed doctrine of a self-contained and immutable trinity who has his simple being independent of his acts of relation, his act of relation to creation. For Bart, God's being is constituted by his gracious relation to creatures in Jesus Christ. God does not have a self-contained nature that remains the same as he relates to creation or that obtains apart from the relation to creation. Rather, he has his being in his gracious time act toward us in Jesus Christ. And he has his being in no other way but this sovereignly, freely willed event of grace in Jesus Christ. God's being and man's being, for that matter, cannot be abstractly considered at any point. For God to be God, He must be God in His gracious act that is in Jesus Christ. And for man to be man, He must be man in that same gracious act. For Bart, God and man exist an eternal act of grace that consists in correlativity in the event of freedom and love that Bart calls Jesus Christ. Dr. Cassidy has pointed out that this time event is God's time for us in Jesus Christ. Now this actualistic ontology, this doctrine that God has His essentially gracious being in the primordial event of Jesus Christ, this means at least three things initially when we contrast Bart's view to our theology developed earlier in my first two main lectures. First, for Bart, in Jesus Christ, 
There are no relations of subsistence or coherence among immutable persons of the Godhead. There are no living, immutable, and unchanging Trinitarian persons who have their being apart from relation to creation. They do not exist. Bart rejects such doctrines as abstract due to his doctrine of divine human correlativity in the Christ of it. Second, the immutable person of the Spirit does not relate to the heaven temple in a relation of indoxation and the immutable person of the Son does not exist in a relation of incoronation to the heaven temple. This is abstraction of the highest order for Bart. There simply is no such thing as indoxation or incoronation. And third, Adam and Eve were never created in fellowship with God. Adam is not created from the dust of the earth, but a symbol for all men. Adam and Eve live, as Dr. Cassidy has said, in our time, not God's time for us. Bart denied an historical Adam in the traditional reform sense. He affirmed the first man in our time was immediately the first sinner. And so, by way of bare preview, those three basic points, Bart denies perichoresis as we defined it, indoxation and incoronation as we defined it, image and covenant as we defined it, and in its place, he looks to the Word of God for his alternative. Enough of overview. Let's look from some primary sources at Bart's church dogmatics, especially his, his CD 3.2. CD 3.2. Now, it's difficult to set forth Bart's doctrine of creation in the Church Dogmatics 3.2 due to the less than linear form of his argument. But I want to try to summarize his presentation under headings that correspond to basic movements in his argument and that structure his presentation. The doctrine of creation, uh, the doctrine of creation in light of Genesis 1.1, the absolute beginning, forges for Bart the primordial actualization of God's time for us, understood as a transcendent time event in which God and man have their being in a single act of divine grace in Jesus Christ. But standing in the way of this interpretation is Genesis 1.1, which we've just considered in its pluriform uh, relations to other scriptures in the Bible. What does Bart say about Genesis 1-1 and how does it relate to his doctrine of creation? Well, first, Bart says that Genesis 1-1 is a corrupted has a corrupted pagan source. Genesis 1-1 has a corrupted pagan source. He says Genesis 1-1 contains a cosmology corrupted by pagan ancient Near Eastern mythology so that we must turn instead to the Word of God in Jesus Christ for our doctrine of the absolute beginning of heaven and earth. He goes so far as to say in three, uh, CD 3.2, pages 4 through 7, that readings of Genesis 1.1 that find a cosmology taught in Scripture will in the nature of the case be compromised, listen, by secular, philosophical, mythological outlooks that have no revelational authority at all. It's stunning to read particularly if you're not aware of critical method. He's emphatic and clear. Let me give you a quote. Uh, CD 326. 
He says, even in the biblical witness to God's revelation, by the way, Scripture, I'm so glad, that's why I'm using this diagram. Scripture is a witness to revelation. It's not revelation. He says, even in the biblical witness to God's revelation, human faith has very simply and powerfully used the language of more than one oriental world myth and the corresponding sciences. And then that of Judaistic speculation and the popular cosmology of Hellenism. In the centuries that followed, and especially in the case of some of its most distinguished champions, the church shared in the great renewal of Platonism then very widely in that of Aristotelianism, and later still a time which was popularly decisive for its own formulation in that of the ancient Stoics. Listen, it followed and expanded almost the entire succession of ensuing philosophies and their worldviews, or rather the entire cycle of modern worldviews and their accompanying philosophies by establishing theological systems corresponding to them, end of quote. You're going to have to bear with me as I quote from Bart, but I want you um, aware of his own language. Now, let me summarize what he's saying there. You have to understand it. The witness to Revelation in Genesis 1-1 uses more than one oriental world myth to express its cosmology. And the theological systems developed according to these world myths compounded the problems by adopting more and more and more world myths. It's a grim picture and poses a problem we must address. What is that problem? The witness to revelation in the scriptures has been corrupted by pagan mythological conceptions. But Bart has a solution to this problem. He says, quote, CD 327, the fact that this has continually happened does not mean, however, that the Word of God itself, which is the object of Christian faith, and therefore of church dogmatics, contains a specific cosmology which is our duty to expound. We justify this assertion by the following considerations. And I'm just going to give you a few quotes. He says, first, the Word of God, as expressed in its witness, although it has constantly allied itself with the cosmologies, has never yet engendered its own distinctive worldview, but in this respect can always be made more or less critical use of alien views, end of quote. What is he saying? He's saying the word of God as witness, which is the Bible, is filled with ancient pagan myths and errors and has allied itself with worldviews that are opposed to Christian faith. He says, secondly, the reason why there is no revealed or biblical worldview characteristic of and necessary to the Christian kerygma is that faith in the Word of God can never find its theme in the totality of the created world. It believes in God in His relation to man who lives under heaven and earth, but it does not believe in this or that constitution of heaven and earth. If in handling its own proper theme, it could not help formulating certain theories about heaven and earth, it always formulated them provisionally. And if in its formulations it used materials derived from certain modes of conceiving the world, it could never identify itself with these views in any true or essential sense. It could not make them the true content of its own witness and confession. End of quote. The corruption of the cosmologies that are employed in Genesis 1 1 renders them unfit. They are provisional views of reality that cannot be equated with the Word of God 
with revelation itself in Jesus Christ. And he goes on, I'll read two more quotes. He goes on to say, From the fact that faith committed to its own special theme can give only incidental attention to creation as a whole, it follows that its relation to the cosmological presuppositions and consequences of its witness and confession could and can only be supremely non-committal. Let me do a hard pause. He's saying Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and earth, non-committal on that. That is simply a regurgitated statement of a synthesis of oriental pagan myth. Back to the quote. It never accepts the material of changing worldviews for its own sake. Sometimes it uses it at one point only to discard it as another. It can pass from one worldview to another without being untrue to itself, i.e. to its object. It is always free in relation to all such conceptions. CD 328. So what does he say? He's saying Genesis 1.1. And the texts that we looked at that build on it are not to be taken as direct revelation, but compromised pagan mythologies that have worked their way into the biblical witness to revelation. He goes on to say, Everywhere in certain types of thought among certain Christians and movements, we think we detect an absolute union of faith with this or that worldview, but we are not really dealing with faith at all, but with a partial deviation from faith, such as is always possible in the life of the church and individuals. Hence, it is not legitimate to infer from this process that this kind of absolute assimilation of faith to alien worldviews is characteristic of or necessary to Christian faith. So if I could flip the board over and show you what was up the previous lecture, Bart would say, that's a myth. It is a myth. It's a series of unfortunate mistakes that have been made in textual assimilation of alien worldviews. And he says then, faith cannot be true to its object and rely on such corrupted witnesses. Now, isn't that something? The witness to Jesus Christ in Genesis 1-1 is corrupt. This drives Bart, and this is so well known among Bart interpreters, but it drives Bart to seek recourse, not to a myth-infested and error-ridden witness to Revelation in Genesis 1-1, but to revelation itself. It's going to drive Bart, contrary to this Genesis narrative, to what he's going to call the Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God, according to Bart, as revelation, simply is God's gracious act of revelation in Jesus Christ. It is the only concrete locus for our doctrine of creation. And so, this is very important to grasp, when Bart turns us away from the corrupted textual witness of Genesis 1-1, he turns us to an activity of God in Revelation to Jesus Christ, who is himself the Word of God. And that can confuse evangelicals. We don't want Genesis 1, we want the Word of God. Well, the threefold form of the Word of God is Scripture that testifies to an event of Revelation, preaching that witnesses or testifies to an event of Revelation. But the Word of God in the central primordial sense of Revelation itself, just is Jesus Christ himself. Bart's explicit about this. Listen to this quote. This is from 3 to 6. He says, Dogmatics has neither the occasion 
nor the duty to become technical cosmology or a Christian worldview. Were it to do so, it would be losing its way in a sphere essentially foreign to it. Its true object is the revealed, written, and declared Word of God. Those who have claimed to have a worldview, it is not for us to say with that with just. Uh, with what justice, have always derived it from sources other than the Word of God. Here at the outset, we part company with the exponents of all worldviews. Now, when Bart speaks here of the Word of God in this threefold form, the Word of God is not as Revelation, something deposited in the Scripture, possessed by the church, or the disclosure of some divinely revealed truth committed to a written form. The Word of God cannot be at any point and in any sense identified with such. The Word of God revealed is not the Word of God in its in scripturated form, not the Word of God in its preached form. It is the Word of God in its actualized form in Jesus Christ. Scripture and preaching are fallible witnesses to the event of revelation. So when Bart invokes the Word of God in this context and sets it over against the inscripturated witness of Genesis 1-1, he is thinking of nothing other than the event of revelation in Jesus Christ. Listen to this. He's explicit. This is 3-2-6. Here, and please hear this. The Word of God is concerned with God and man. It gives us an ontology of man. And we will be concerned with this in the doctrine of creation, with the ontology of man living under heaven and on earth. The Word of God does not contain any ontology of heaven and earth themselves. So what is the Word of God concerned with? It's concerned with God and man, and with an ontology of God and man. And I'm so thankful that Dr. Cassidy has given us the lectures that he's given us because for Bart, the ontology of God and man is found in Jesus Christ. For Bart, God exists in a primordial relation to humanity, in the gracious event of Jesus Christ, and in no other way. There is no God behind this God, Jesus Christ. There is no man behind this man, Jesus Christ. The ontology of God and man is that they are given in the same transcendent time event in a singular event of primordial grace. To seek a God in back of this God, or a man in back of this man, Jesus Christ, is to seek after abstractions. But when you seek God and man, listen, in the Word of God, in Jesus Christ, you find God and man in an event of revelation and reconciliation. You remember Dr. Cassidy's lines here, that God and man are are reconciled to one another. God reveals himself exhaustively to man. Man gives himself exhaustively to God in Jesus Christ. Both divine and human being are constituted in this transcendent time event. So Bart's actualistic doctrine of God and Bart's actualistic doctrine of man is the ontology of of the Word of God. It's the ontology of man disclosed in the Word of God. But that raises the question, if Genesis 1-1 
pushes Bart to the Word of God, which is Jesus Christ. The actualizing of divine and human being in a single transcendent time event in the absolute beginning. How do we interpret Genesis 1-1? Let me put it this way. If Genesis 1-1 is part of this scriptural witness to the event of Revelation, and Genesis 1-1 speaks of heaven and earth, how are we to interpret heaven and earth in relation to the Word of God? Well, secondly, the Word of God as revelation comprises in Bart's mind the covenant of grace, the covenant between God and man in Jesus Christ. And to state it crisply, Jesus Christ is the actualizing of and fulfilling of the covenant of grace between God and man in the absolute beginning. But what does that make of Genesis 1-1? How does, the, how does the Word of God relate to the corrupted cosmology of heaven and earth in Genesis 1-1? Listen to what Bart says in CD 2-12. Bart says, and, and listen to this, heaven corresponds, heaven corresponds to the being and action of God. Genesis 1-1 is the being and action of God. He goes on to say, earth corresponds to the being and action of of man. Heaven being an action of God, earth being an action of man. The conjunction of heaven and earth corresponds to the covenant in which divine and human being and action meet. And so, lo and behold, this is the covenant of grace. Pardon me for being under the line here. I'm transgressing a very uh, sacred boundary. It's only for pedagogical purposes. This does not put the covenant of grace in history, in our time, in a lower boundary. So I'm not passing that boundary. But here's what Bart's saying. This relation of heaven and earth corresponds to the being and action of God, the being and action of man, as both the being and action of God and man meet in the covenant actualized in the absolute beginning. Hence, Bart says, the created world surrounding man, the totality of created existence above and below him, is the prototype and pattern for that which he is addressed by the word of God in his life in communion with his creator. Now, let me put this simply. The creation of heaven and earth in the absolute beginning corresponds to the being and action of God, heaven, the being and action of man, earth, as representing a covenant where divine and human action and being meet in a primordial, transcendent time event in God's time for us. In the absolute beginning, we do not find the creation of heaven and earth as we understood it in the earlier lectures. We find instead the actualized being of God and man submerged in a common time and existing in a mutually determining relation. We find in Genesis 1-1, in the language of heaven and earth, the eternally actualized covenant of grace between God and man in the event of Jesus Christ. Now let me be explicit and apply this to what we've said earlier. The cosmology of heaven and earth that we looked at in previous lectures, 
yields a robust God-centered theology. Eternal, uh, the, the primal epiphany of indoxation, the primal epiphany of incoronation. Bart says that is myth. That is abstract theology. So Bart sets that aside in the interest of the Word of God, which consists in a covenant of grace actualized in a transcendent time event between God and man in Jesus Christ. Indoxation, as we described it, abstract. Why? It speaks of immutable persons dwelling in holy places. In coronation, abstract for the same reason. Heaven temple, abstract for the same reason. You see, for Bart, neither the divine nor the human, get this now, have any existence apart from divine action and divine uh, being and divine action meeting in the primordial transcendent time event of Jesus Christ. Bart looks at what we say about perichoresis and doxation and coronation, image and covenant, and he says, how abstract can you get? And in place of it, Bart begins with God and man in a correlative relation to Jesus Christ in a transcendent time event. Now, what, what did we say earlier about indoxation and incoronation? That revelation is God-centered, not man-centered. In a stunning admission, Bart admits that beginning with the Word of God, this is a quote, is anthropocentric. Now, you've got to get your mind around this. Bart says this, quote, it's understanding the Word of God, which is what? Word of God is Jesus Christ. You're going to see a theme here. The heaven is God. Earth is man. Heaven and earth meeting in Jesus Christ is the covenant of grace. It's the Word of God. It's the concrete event of revelation to which the Scripture bears witness but doesn't pass the boundary. Uh, preaching bears witness, doesn't pass the boundary in, into that primordial time dimension. They're brought together. Word of God. Here's what Bart says. He says, The Word of God's understanding of God's creation is anthropocentric to the extent that it follows the orientation prescribed for it by the Word of God, God's orientation to man. Do you hear that? That's CD 312. True theocentrism for Bart must in the nature of the case be anthropocentric. Anthropocentrism. Why? Because God and man have their being actualized in a single event of grace, in a single and simple time event. Concretely considered in light of the Word of God, divine and human being are actualized in the same temporal event, in the absolute beginning, making His doctrine of creation actualized anthropocentrism. The doctrine of creation simply is God's being, God's action, man's being, man's action, meeting in a common time event from the absolute beginning. See, for Bart then, true theocentrism is anthropocentrism, and true anthropocentrism is theocentrism. For all his rhetorical bluster, that medieval Catholicism, 17th century federalism, 19th and 20th century liberalism are anthropocentric, what is Bart's answer? Anthropocentrism. Isn't that something? Bart's answer to all of these anthropocentric approaches is to say it's not anthropocentric, it's anthropocentric. But anthropocentric, anthropocentric how? Actualized. Man's being given in the same event that God's being is given. Divine and human being are mutually constituted always together in the same time event. So that Bart, when you understand him, is saying, 
that true theocentrism entails a, an always actualized anthropocentrism because Jesus Christ is electing God and elect man. Jesus Christ is the true and living God and the real man primordially. Now, this leads me to observe something about Barth's seamless expression of mutualism in the 20th century. And let me explain this point. Barth transcends, as far as I see it, every dipolar presentation of mutualism in the 20th century. The notion that God has two sets of attributes. An essential set of attributes apart from creation that does not change, and a contingent set of attributes in relation to creation that changes. Dipolar theism, represented uh, preeminently in its pure and intellectually rigorous form by Alfred North Whitehead, John Cobb, Charles Hartshorn, all teach in some way or another that God is affected by and changed in relation to his creatures. Hartshorn proposed a dipolar God characterized by both eternity and time, immutability and change, omniscience and ignorance. Um, Whitehead spoke of the consequent nature of God given his relation to space and time in actual occasions. The central thesis of all forms of dipolar theism is that God exists in terms of contrasting dipolar attributes. Eternity, time. Immutability, mutability. Impassibility, passibility. Omniscience, ignorance. That these are the two ways that we speak of God so that we can maintain a place for classical attributes on the one side and neoclassical or relational attributes on the other side. Evangelical expressions of dipolar theism, lower level, less rigorous, less important expressions, maintain either that God the Creator has both an atemporal mode of existence and a temporal mode of existence, or essential properties that don't change, covenantal properties that do change. But Bart's version, here's what I want you to appreciate. Bart's version of mutualism goes beyond these dipolar proposals. For Bart, God and man are concretely constituted in a single, seamless, act of grace in a supernal time event. God is not divided. God is not torn asunder by diverse attribute sets. He doesn't have two dipolar sets of attributes. God is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God so that Whatever we want to say about Barth's mutualism versus the mutualism of dipolar theism, I would call it a mutualism of a higher order. A mutualism that brings intimately the creature into the same event by which God's being is constituted. He's a mutualist, mutualist as I say, of a higher order. He doesn't affirm bald dipolar constructions found in Hartshorn, Cobb, Frame, or others. Therefore, as you come full circle, Bart's theocentrism is at the same time and in the same event anthropocentrism by Bart's own admission. And for those who are aware of his rhetoric that um, all views that start with man are expressions of the analogia entis in natural theology. For him to turn around and make this formulation is quite a stunning uh, admission. Now, I don't want to comment at this point on Catholicism or liberalism, but I can offer you no clearer example 
of a view that at no point is, the, is anthropocentric than what I gave you in the first two lectures regarding indoxation and incoronation, wholly apart from the creation of man as the image of God and in covenant with God. If Bart is a mutualist of a higher order, indoxation and incoronation is a theocentrism of a higher order. Over against this, Bart, Bart uh, stresses this anthropocentric starting point where God and uh, divine and human being are given in the same event. The word of God, the covenant of grace, lie at the center of Bart's proposal. So, in place, as we're moving forward, in place of the cosmology of Genesis 1 and all that we developed, Bart sees heaven and earth corresponding to the being and action of God, being and action of man, earth, primordially related in the covenant of grace, which is the substance of the word of God, God's time for us in Jesus Christ. This is the sum and substance of Bart's actualized doctrine of creation in Jesus Christ. And in the next section, I want us to move on and talk about how Jesus Christ as real man participates in the actualized essence of God in a transcendent time event of reconciliation and revelation and the ecumenical potential that opens for dialogue with post-Vatican II Roman Catholic theology. Third main point, uh, Jesus Christ as real man in this primordial event of God's time for us participates in the actualized essence of God in the transcendent time event of revelation and reconciliation, the Word of God. Bart says this, CD 32, page 132. The ontological determination of humanity is grounded in the fact that one man among all others is the man Jesus. So long as we select any other starting point for our study, we shall reach only the phenomena of the human. We are condemned to abstractions as long as our attention is riveted, as it were, on other men, or rather man in general. As if we could learn about real man from a study of man in general and in abstraction from the fact that one man among all others is the man Jesus. In this case, we miss the one Archimedean point given us beyond humanity and therefore the one possibility of discovering the ontological determination of man. Theological anthropology has no choice in this matter. It is not yet or no longer theological anthropology if it tries to pose and answer the question of the true being of man from any other angle but Jesus Christ. We remember who and what the man Jesus is. And here is the quote. As we have seen, he is the one creaturely being in whose existence we have to do immediately and directly with the being of God also. I have that last sentence italicized. Please hear this well. As Dr. Cassidy's noted, there is no direct revelation in history in our time. There is direct revelation only in Geshikta, God's time for us, in the humanity of Jesus. But that revelation is understood as an immediate and direct participation in the graciously willed, temporally qualified being of God. The being is not independent being. The being is not immutable being as traditional Reformed theology defines it, or simple being, or being prior to and apart from God's free relation in love 
to Jesus Christ in time. God doesn't have such being. Rather, God's being is his freely willed decision to be God for us in his grace in Jesus Christ. The being of God is actualized being, a being that is determined by God's freedom, love, and grace to relate in Jesus Christ. But notice this, and this is key. Jesus relates in an immediate and direct way to the being of God. I'm not going to draw this as a consequence I do at the end of my Van Til book. This is precisely the Thomistic conception of the beatific vision, where there's direct and immediate participation in the unactualized essence of God. Bart has that affirmed here. Yet, it is a direct and immediate participation in the actualized being of God. Jim Cassidy has argued persuasively in God for Us that Bart's soteriological antithesis between God's time and man's fallen time is overcome in a third time, God's time for us. Now, I don't want to confuse anyone, but once God relates to Jesus Christ and God's time for us, there are, in effect, only two times. God's time for us in Jesus Christ and our fallen time. So in light of those two time events, there is an absolute antithesis, what you could call a soteriological antithesis of time events. God's man, God's time and man's fallen time exist in an antithesis. Jesus Christ, God's time for us, brings those two polarities together in a synthetic movement, as it were, while not changing the character of fallen time simpliciter. But the point that I want to make is that the being of God in which Christ participates isn't really being at all. It's time. Jesus Christ participates in God's time for us. He participates directly. He participates immediately. Cassidy says in his God's time for us, Bart's reconciliation of eternity and time in Jesus Christ, in the CD, time serves as the common sphere which both God and humanity share in Jesus Christ. Cassidy calls this, and I agree with him, a temporally qualified analogia entis or an analogia temporis. True humanity participates in God's time for us in Jesus Christ so that the participative act is temporally qualified. But I want you to note this. It is immediate and direct and exhaustive. There is correlativism between God and man of the highest actualized order as both are mutually and primordially constituted in the same time event. Time, not being, provides for Bart the category that facilitates the mutualizing action of divine and human relationality in the supernal event of Jesus Christ. God, as true God, initiates the time event. Jesus, as real man, participates in that time event. But once effected, the two exist in an exhaustively mutualized relation. Why? Because divine and human being are mutually constituted and actualized in a common time in Jesus Christ. It is a true analogia temporis that unites actualized divine and actualized human being in Jesus Christ. One more quote from Bart about Jesus Christ as 
participant in the actualized being of God. Quote, there's no such thing as a created nature which has its purpose, being, or continuance apart from grace, or wh which may be known in this purpose, being, or continuance except through grace. In Barth's own words, in the Christ event, God generates a being, quote, distinct from himself, ordained for salvation, for perfect being, for participation in his own being. Now, to participate in God's being is to participate in God's grace. And God's grace simply is His gracious, transcendent time event for us in Jesus Christ. I'll say this as a side note because I'm not going to talk about this, but this doctrine of direct and immediate participation in the essence of God is by and large the main point of continuity that Keith Johnson and Joseph White note in their discussion between Bart and Aquinas in the unofficial dialogue volume that McCormick and White edited. And the point is this, both traditional Roman Catholicism and Karl Barth believe in the participation of humanity in the essence of God. The main difference is that for Barth, that essence is a time event, an actualized temporal event of grace. Whereas for Rome, it's an ontological reproportioning of human nature by sacerdotal grace so that Human nature is elevated above its created nature to participate in the simple, immutable being of God. Different conceptions of essence and being, but participation unites them both. For Rome, it is the traditional analogia entis, a participation in the being of God through ontological reproportioning. For Bart, it's a temporally reconfigured analogia an analogia temporis, but the point is that the humanity of Jesus in the consummation, according to traditional Roman uh, uh, Catholic theology, and all who are in Christ have a direct and immediate apprehension, intellective apprehension of the essence of God. And Bart is saying the same thing in a temporally reconfigured analogia. That is why both Thomists and Bardians can see such profound ecumenical points of contact that escapes ordinary evangelical readings. But what we're going to do next as we continue on is ask the question of how fallen time, image bearers in fallen time, relate to this primordial event of revelation and reconciliation in Jesus Christ. And I'll expound some of the work of Robert Strimple on this matter of the image of God as we speak of our time.